Does that work? Yep. Can you hear me? Sweet. Cool. So yeah, what I was talking about, I got to find an F-18 today, so that was pretty sweet. Um, if I stammer some, that may be why. <laughs> it was a lot more intense than I expected. Anyways, um, let's open in prayer first, and then we'll get started after that. So pray with me. God, I thank you for uh, tonight. I thank you for this chance just to uh, minister to your flock a little bit. God, I thank you uh, for the wisdom you've given me for this message, Lord, and I pray you that your message would go out, Lord, that your word would not return void. Uh, God, and that lives would be changed, and God, that we would experience a little bit of you today. You know what I pray? Amen. Cool. So, as most of y'all probably know, Rod is in... Sorry, I'm going to get this stuff turned on. I'm used to sitting in a circle when I do these, so if I randomly calling people, that's why, so I'm used to. Um, so as many of y'all know, Rod's in Jamaica right now, which is funny, since it's exactly where my wife and I were about two weeks ago uh, for our honeymoon. And he's in Galena, which is about 15 minutes or so from Ocho Rios, which is where we spent uh, the two weeks there. And as I was thinking about that, uh, I was, my mind was brought back to a conversation we had with our, one of our bus drivers. Yeah? Nope, he's fixing it. Am I good? Yep. Is that better? Yeah. Same? All right. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we had a, bu a bus driver that we met. His name was Omar. Really cool guy. <laughs> yep, going back out. Is that? Clear? Mm -hmm. Is that better? <laughs> so don't move. Stay in this position the whole time. Anyways, we were having a conversation with one of our bus drivers, Omar, and he told us that he had grown up in church and that he had recently decided that he wanted to instead club and party. And he, it was interesting because he made it sound like it was a decision. He's like, I can either do church or I can do this club and party thing. And when I asked him why, he said that, well, the church is down there. Uh, they didn't seem to practice. Man, this thing's going to be trouble the whole time. Slack? That? Is that better? I don't care. Okay. Sure, we'll use that. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Now? Better? Okay. That one's not going to fall off my ear. <laughs> cool. Anyways, so those were the two options he had. Basically, clubbing or Christianity. Uh, and... In one sense, I was kind of excited because he didn't, realize, he didn't have this deception where he could do both at the same time. Uh, but I was sad because I asked him why. And he said that whenever he went to church, it really just seemed like people didn't really invite him in and they just seemed to want his money. And it became a reality to me that that was the perception of Christian down there. And so as I was thinking about and praying about what uh, to talk about tonight, because Rod gave me a call a couple of days ago, uh, that really came to mind, this idea that we do a good job ministering to the lost, and we know what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to evangelize. We know how we're supposed to share the gospel. But sometimes I think churches miss the mark on how we're supposed to minister to each other. And so tonight's message is about living as good shepherds. So I'm going to start in John uh, 21. Sorry, I don't have slides. Uh, I was a little busy earlier today. But I'm going to start in John 21. Um, Jesus is talking to Peter, and this is just so we get a sense of the commandment that Jesus gave and the importance that Jesus gives towards taking care of the flock. So everyone's there. It's going to be about three verses. So John 21, 15, and I'm in the New American Standard. Uh, so when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus replies, tend my lambs. Second time he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because the Lord had said to him a third time, do you love me? Uh, and he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus then said, tend my sheep. And without getting a whole lot into the theological significance of three times and into what the different questions meant, the point that I want to make there is that Jesus is very, very clear that loving him is evident by caring for the flock. That's one of our calls. But it's interesting because we serve, we kind of live in this dual role, right? We're the sheep, we're part of his flock, like pastors tend to us, Rod tends to us, for me personally, 
uh, Fab and Elvira tend to my wife and I. And I'm sure many of you have people that disciple you or that minister to you. So we're sheep, but we're shepherds at the same time. And so uh, this works because it's not about the credit of being the leader, but about ministering to the Lord's people as he leads. So in Hinosis, where I do most of my um, teaching, I often pass out Bible verses and ask people to read them. And so I'm going to do a little bit of that, not as much as I normally do, but a little bit. Uh, so I'll get to those in a minute. So there's benchmarks here, and I want to make it clear that tonight I'm not talking about how you become a Christian, because I am under the impression that most people who go to a Wednesday night service at least know the gospel message. They know what it takes to become a believer. I'm not saying everyone that comes is a believer, but they, they at least know what the steps are supposed to be. So that's not what this is about. But this is about the people who live as the righteous ones. What do they have in common? So we're going to spend some time in Matthew 5, verses 31 to 46. And I'm not there yet, so I'm going to flip my way over to that. Oh, this is the one where I... Maybe I'll check that. I think this is actually the message where my verses were in the wrong spot. All right. It's not Matthew 5. Give me one second here, guys. People who are to notice this, remember when I did this during the this message that time too. I forgot to change my notes. So I apologize for that. One second. All right. So I have the wrong thing in my notes. I apologize for that. Uh, so instead, I'm going to um, skip over to Ezekiel, which is the next thing, which is fine. We can deal with that. So give me one second. It's going to be Ezekiel 34, verses 17 and 34, if you want to uh, go there before me. I'm sorry, 31, not 34 there. So, verse 17, um, the Lord says, As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will judge between one sheep and another, between the rams and the male goats. Over in 31, As for you, my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, you are men, and I am your God, declares the Lord. So what we see in Ezekiel 34, which is throughout this passage, is that Israel is going to be judged, um, not by their nationality or earthly identity, but simply by where they store up treasures. There's another verse that talks about where you store up treasures, there your heart is also. Let me grab some water. So while I get some water, someone go to Luke 16, verses 13 and 15, and someone else go to 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 12. What I really like about that passage in Ezekiel is that there is an importance on how we live our lives now. It's not just a matter of becoming a believer and then essentially having fire insurance for later in life. Um, and it's not just the moment of salvation, but it's about living your lives out. So, let me flip over to Luke. All right. So Luke 16, 13 to 15, uh, it says, No servant can serve two masters, for either we hate one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and wealth. Now the Pharisees who were lovers of money were listening to him at all these things and were scoffing at him. And he said to them, you are those who justify, justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. It's very easy when we look at how the world defines success, how the world defines love, how the world defines pretty much anything to really miss the mark as Christians. You think about it, um, the world would say, help someone, but not so much that it hurts yourself. And well, Jesus says, 
love is this, that you die for someone else. The world says the American dream requires becoming a millionaire. The American dream requires achieving as much as possible. And that's just simply not what we see in Scripture. And now let me go over to 1 Timothy um, 6, 9 through 12. Hold on a second here. And so this is again about wealth. Paul writes, But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a, and a snare, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith, take hold of eternal life, to which you were called, and you made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. For my wife and I, this is um, a topic that we've spent a lot of time really wrestling with over the last few months as we neared our wedding, and now as we're past the wedding and moving forward, it's extremely easy to lose sight of what really matters. And I think living as good shepherds requires thinking more about the sheep than about how attractive your staff is or if your robes are the latest fashion or anything along those lines. So, I'm now going to jump over to James uh, chapter 2, verses 14 to 20. Give me one second. Okay, so this is about faith and works, and we see this a lot in Scripture, where faith and works are put together, and the challenge is that often people look at that, and they see a works-based gospel, and that's what we're talking about. Instead, what we're talking about is a faith that is evidenced by works. So, in James, what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm and be filled, and yet do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. But the demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? It's interesting, because um, if you think about in other religions, you have a monk or someone who goes off to study their belief system and get in their minds close to their God. They may go live off on a mountain. They may be secluded somewhere. And that's great. Perhaps they get an enlightenment and an understanding in whatever pursuit they're after uh, that's unparalleled. But what does that do? What benefit is that? There's not one. And I think there's, there's a thing that the Pharisees got wrong too, is they spent so much time studying the scriptures. They knew them real, very well. I'm sure many of them could recite massive passages from the Old Testament. But they missed the point of simply loving each other and loving each other well. Jesus writes in John, and I apologize, I don't know the verse off the top of my head, uh, but he says, you diligently study the scriptures because you think by them you possess eternal life, but you forget to realize that the scriptures point to me. And so I think that's the challenge um, that was very painfully shown to me when I was in Jamaica. I was talking to Omar, and I realized that the people there, the Christians there, the people that said they were Christians at least, knew their Bible well enough to understand the role of Jesus in history they probably knew it well enough to teach somewhat about the things that he said. But they weren't living out love because someone who had been in the church thought that partying and clubbing was a lot better. It's a really cool thing for us. We get to see people come into Hinosis that uh, some of them have been in church their whole lives and this is a natural progression for them and they quickly um, get plugged in right away and are able to start pouring out. But many times we get people that come in and they don't really know a whole lot about Christian living. Maybe they went to church, maybe they became believers recently, uh, but they spend their time 
doing things the world does because that's what makes sense to the world. The message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing, but to those who are redeemed is the gift of God. So when we see that, we realize that people who are able to pull themselves out of that life of sin, who are able to begin walking in righteousness again, they don't really ever want to turn back. And I've been, we've been doing this now for uh, almost two years, which is a crazy thought in my mind. Uh, it seems like just the other day we were getting started, but it'll be two years in August. And I can't think of a time when someone who was walking with the world turned around and said, man, you know this love thing y'all do, how you care for each other? I don't really want that anymore. Instead, I want to go party again. And I can think of plenty of times in the past in other churches I was a part of where people sat there and said, you know, you'll seem just like everyone else. You just don't cuss as much or you don't drink as much. But otherwise, I can't really tell a difference. You still talk bad about other people behind their back. You still mock people. You spend more time worrying about your own gain than you do looking after the needs of others. The reality is this. We can preach the gospel as much as we want, but if we don't look a thing like the Jesus we're telling the world they need, then why would they choose to follow him? And so that's, uh, it was just a crazy thought to me. Um, Hebrews 6.10, give me one second to pull that up. If someone else, I actually have someone read this one out loud. Someone go to Proverbs 19.17, please. Just an interesting thought. I'm kind of curious, by a show of hands, and this may be everyone and maybe very few people, how many times have you driven by someone who's just begging for money on the side of the road, or maybe you walk by them somewhere, and thought of that as an opportunity to lend to the Lord? It changed our perspective quite a bit. Uh, I know there's been a handful of times in my life, mostly because I've read that before and thought about this exact point, but it changes your perspective on the money that's in your wallet when you think of it as giving something to the Lord. I mean, that's what Proverbs says, right? The Book of Wisdom says, he who gives to the poor lends to the Lord. That brings me back to another story. Uh, this is probably, out of all the stories we had in our honeymoon, which there was plenty, this is probably our favorite. Uh, there was one night we went to dinner, and the r resort we stayed at was an all-inclusive, meaning we'd already paid for everything ahead of time. And so they had a pretty strict no-tipping policy, mostly so the servers wouldn't treat certain guests poorly and treat the more wealthy guests better. And every now and then we decided it was worth it to break it because the people just, it Lord laid it in our heart or uh, they just did a great job and we wanted to reward that. And so one night in particular, we were sitting there, we'd finished eating and I looked over at Nicole and I was like, I got two bills in my wallet. One's a five and one's a 20. And obviously the meal's free. So there's no gauge of what people tip. Usually we'd seen other people tip, it was like a dollar or two. And um, so we kind of thought about it a little bit, and Fab knows this, and so do a number of other people. I'm fairly conservative when it comes to financial things. I don't like to spend money very much. Um, and Nicole and I talked about it, and we kind of said, you know, we should just give them the 20. That's fine. And so the server came back, and the Lord kind of hit me, and he was like, is $5 really going to make a difference to you? And so I was like, yeah, touche. So I reached in my pocket, gave them both. And didn't think much of it, but the next day uh, at lunch, we, or breakfast, one of the two, we see the guy, and he runs across the uh, cafeteria to come say hi and talk to us. And it was just his face had lit up. Suddenly, he had been seen not just as a servant, but as someone of value. And so we got to talk to him some more. We talked about uh, his past, how he had grown up, and where he had lived, the hardships he had faced. And that, that conversation continued throughout the day. Well, the next day, uh, I got his Facebook information so we could keep in touch afterwards. And uh, the Lord kind of laid in my heart like, hey, he doesn't know about me. And so I sent him a message, and I was like, hey, we're leaving Sunday, um, so we have one more full day. This was Friday. Uh, we'd like to hang out. Like, are you free? What's your schedule like? And it turned out he, had work, he was working a double that Saturday, so there was no time during the day, but he would be off at about 10 o'clock at night. And so we agreed. I was like, sweet, we'll meet you at the room. Um, and so I told him what room we were in. And he came up, and we had ordered some coffee so he could kind of be served for a minute because that resort, all he did was serve other people. 
So we poured him a glass of coffee. We sat down and we started talking. And I realized that this was a person that was living a lot more like a Christian than many Christians I know. He was doing all the right things. He was loving people. He was selfless. He had turned down jobs overseas that would have paid a lot better because his aunt needed money to fix her car and he now couldn't afford a plane ticket to get to the job or uh, all these things. And so as we started talking, uh, I shared the gospel with him. And it was like in his head, you saw the dots connect. And so he prayed to receive Christ that night. It was a fantastic experience. And as we were leaving, I kept, I kept looking back on that relationship, that conversation wouldn't start if I was unwilling to hold on to potentially as little as $5 or even as most as $25. And so that verse in Proverbs really uh, strikes close to home because for $25, we were able to start a friendship and a relationship with uh, a young man who's about 23 years old who now will be walking in heaven. And I've been talking to him since, and he's talked repeatedly about trying to study, not having time, but knowing he needs to make time. And it just makes me think, and it kind of puts things in perspective. Like, what are we living for? Are we living for here and now? Because Fav and I run numbers all the time. $25 over time can grow, and if invested properly, it can do a lot of great things, but it doesn't matter if it's twenty five or 25000 There's a person who's in heaven. Because for a moment, uh, the Lord gave us the foresight to forsake the earthly things. And so that's my charge, and that's my challenge as we keep going forward. There's a few more verses I want to go through. But look at people begging. Look at everyday interactions as an opportunity to start a relationship that may lead in someone's salvation. And who knows? That person, uh, his name is Wendell, if you want to pray for him. He's a great guy. He may end up being a missionary down there. He may be someone that changes the culture in Jamaica and leads hundreds or thousands to the Lord. But it starts with us recognizing an opportunity and being willing to walk in faith, even in something really small, like $20 at a meal that you didn't pay for at the time. So, uh, Hebrews 6.10, For God is not unjust as to forget your work and the love which you have shown towards his name in having ministered and still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each one of you shown the, had each, of, each one of you shown the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end so that you will not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises of the Lord. I mean, that's a pretty cool promise to have, inheriting the promises that God gave to those that came before us throughout Scripture. Um, And so the purpose of this is not to scare people into loving better, or make you feel bad if you're not loving as well as you think you should. But I do think that's an interesting emotion because I think whenever there is some sort of twinge internally, there's some sense, perhaps the Holy Spirit, kicking in that's spurring us towards change, towards being better. And so I do do hope that happens. Um, So I'm going to go to a couple more verses, and I apologize that I don't have all these marks. It'll take me a minute to flip through them. The first one's going to be in 1 John 3, 17 and 18. Fortunately, these aren't in the really hard places to find in Scripture where I get lost looking for pages. Actually, I'm just going to leave that off. Okay. 1 John three seventeen and 18. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. We will know by this that we are of truth and will assure our heart before him. And whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him in whatever our heart condemns us. Um, let me keep going here. There's a couple other I want to read at the same time before I make the next point. The next one is going to be John 13, 34 to 35.
so I have a tip to uh, any of y'all that ever get into doing teaching. Never use a new Bible on the first time teaching in front of a large group because there's a whole bunch of random stories and excerpts in here that are really throwing me off looking for my verses. I normally am not this slow, I promise. All right. So this is going to be John 13, 34 to 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as if I have loved you, that you also love one another. This next verse is one of the strongest in Scripture, I think. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And finally, Matthew 9, 36, uh, said another way. Uh, 35 and 36. It's Matthew 9. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of sickness and disease. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plenty and the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. This is interesting. I think Jesus is walking around. He's sharing the gospel. He's doing good deeds. He's healing the sick. And then he's grieved because he sees what the Lord is la- the world is lacking. There was a season in my life um, when I was living in Alaska, which is where I lived before this, that uh, was living very rebelliously wasn't making wise choices. I was going out on the weekends uh, to bars and clubs that I should not have been spending any time at. But it was interesting because when I first got up there, I engaged in that lifestyle for a while. Towards the end, um, I had found a great church, actually a Calvary Chapel, which is one of the reasons that I got connected with this church down here. Uh, Began really walking with the Lord uh, in, in a walk that has mostly continued since then. And one weekend, my roommate at the time asked me to go out with him, and I really had no desire, but I knew if I didn't, he was going to be driving and drinking, and that wasn't a good mix, because it was icy out. Um, The last thing I would want is my sense of, like, oh no, I'm too good to be in that place to lead to someone who wasn't walking with the Lord, uh, potentially wasn't a Christian. I can't remember the exact timeline uh, of that situation. And so I went, and I remember thinking, sitting there, uh, and kind of like it says in this verse, just being grieved, looking at the exact same, some of the same people doing the same things, and instead of seeing an opportunity for sin, just being grieved at seeing a world that's lacking the peace and the hope that I had. And I still see that today. Um, I go out and I, I talk to people all the time who are wildly successful, uh, both in the political sense and the financial sense, and people in the military, and there always seems to be something missing. And it's one of the greatest, most rewarding feelings in the world when you see that light bulb click, like we did with Wendell sitting on our porch, uh, overlooking the place where he works, where all of a sudden he realized that missing piece is Jesus. And it starts with us making a priority to love well. Um, So our love for each other is what the Lord sees and yearns for. By loving each other, we are perhaps in the most real way possible, showing the world what accepting Christ can do for their souls. Whenever we have people that come to Gnosis, and I do this on a regular basis, actually, uh, someone that's been there new, and they've been there a few weeks, I'll ask them either in an open setting like this one or in private, like, hey, why do you keep coming back? What about this place do you like? And the answer is always the same. I can't think of, I don't think I've ever actually gotten a different answer. James, what's the answer always? (laughs) It's always just, this is a group of people that just seems to love me and they don't really have conditions as to why. And that's something we're really excited about. Um, But what we realize then is that's what's connecting. It's not that we're super funny or super talented. It's just that we're loving each other well. And you don't have to be young to do that. You don't have to have a lot of friends to do that. You just need to make a conscious decision that loving someone else is more important than loving yourself that day. Um, And that's certainly not a decision that you can make once for the rest of your life, or even for the week. I think that's a decision you have to make daily. 
I think you have to seek the Lord in the morning, as I am very bad at doing. That will attest. My morning devotions usually are like noon devotions, but they get in. Um, but when you make a daily decision to love well, that resonates, that carries throughout the day. So I'm going to jump to a few more while I'm here. Psalm uh, 23, 2 is the next one I'm going to go to. Give me a second to find it. Okay, here. <clears throat> oh, that's 22. I was confused. This is great. I actually learned this from Pastor Rod. Uh, Psalm 23, 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me, leads me beside quiet waters. Um, this is a really cool thing because most people when they think of quiet waters don't realize what it actually meant. Quiet waters, very, and I'm sure many of you have heard this from Pastor Rod, but what that's actually saying is he leads me beside water that is sitting still and could be infected with bacteria that would make the sheep sick. So he leads me past what is deceptively good and encourages me to rest in green pastures. I think that's one way we can love the church well, encouraging them to rest because anyone that burns out, I don't care how much energy you have, and as my wife will attest, I have a lot of it. Uh, everyone needs rest at some point. So encouraging each other to rest is one way. But also recognizing potential pitfalls, recognizing hazards, and encouraging people to skip those. Whether that's, uh, you're one of the older people here, or you have a little bit more experience, I should say. I probably shouldn't say older. Sorry. Uh, whether you're, you're more seasoned and you have more experience, and you're guiding one of us less experienced people. That's one situation. Perhaps you're the same age and you've just dealt with a situation that someone else is now going through and you recognize the pitfalls. That's one way to love. And that's a way to love that can change lives. And people don't forget those who love them in a tough way or in a season when they really needed love. That's the type of thing you remember. And that's about what leaving a legacy is like. And that's what Rod talks about with his father, how he did. He left a legacy by loving well. There's a couple more I want to do. I only have three more. So, I'm going to go to Luke 15. It's going to be verses 1 through 7. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, saying, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one who is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. I tell you in the same way that there will be more joy, emphasis on more, in having over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. This is important, too, uh, because I think often we get really trapped thinking about, yeah, I could have a conversation with this person, but then there's these five people that I'm not going to be able to talk to. And I have to remind myself, because I tend to butterfly in social settings. Like, pop over to someone, talk to them for a few minutes, and then jump to the next person, talk to them a little bit. Um, <clears throat> but it's incredibly important to, when the Lord calls you to minister to someone to make the most of that opportunity. To realize that you may be called simply to minister to one person for a year. Perhaps more. Perhaps seven years. Perhaps ten years. But there's more rejoicing in heaven over that one person coming to know the Lord than there would be in a thousand people who already know the Lord and don't need repentance. So the point of that, every single person matters dearly. If you feel like the Lord's leading you to someone, don't discredit that because it's only one person. Don't discredit that because it's not a ministry. Don't discredit that because it's not a podium. That's a conversation that needs to happen whether there's a microphone in front of you or not. I'm going to jump over to John chapter 10, verse 11. Got a little water. Uh, 
Uh, this one's interesting. John 10, 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And so we're, we remember from the very beginning when we were talking about in John 21 that Jesus says to Simon Peter, be a shepherd, effectively. Those are, he says it three different ways, but more or less he says, be a shepherd. So Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. My challenge to y'all, are you willing to lay down a weekend plan for the sheep that the Lord has entrusted to your care? Are you willing to wait, lay down an extra hour of sleep because someone needs to talk that night? Maybe it's something more real. Maybe are you willing to lay down upgrading your car this year because the Lord's calling you to send someone on a mission trip or care for a family member who's sick? I don't know what that looks like to everyone, but the reason that the bar is set at laying down your life is because that covers everything. If the bar was a good shepherd will eat second for his sheep, then there's a lot of things that obviously don't quite apply there. But if you're willing to lay down your life, you're willing to lay down anything. Because by definition, on earth, your life is everything. So I think throughout Scripture, that's why Jesus calls us to that. And we realize Jesus never really calls us to a low standard. Jesus says, be perfect, for I am perfect. Be holy as I am holy. He never says sin less. He says, be sinless. Go on and sin no more. Don't go on and sin less. The standard is always the Lord. Anything less than that is really deception, and it's harmful. So I think if we accept that we'd be willing to lay down our life for the sheep, whether that's uh, the lost sheep or if that's a sheep in the flock, if we're willing to lay down our life, then we're willing to do everything else. And sometimes I wonder, uh, and I pray that I would have that sort of resolve in a setting like that, but it's something that I get challenged with every, time, every day. Every day as Nicole and I think about what our life was going to look like, I have to remember, am I willing to lay down my future plans for the sheep if I'm called to do so? That's, it's easy to say. It's a lot harder to do when you have certain offers or attractiveness in one area or temptation in another that appears as an attractive door that the Lord may be opening. That's going to look different in everyone's life. But at the same time, we have to be willing to lay down his life. This is an interesting one. He follows that verse up, and he says, He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep and sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He, the hired hand, flees because he is hired a hand. He is a hired hand and not concerned about the sheep. So I guess the challenge there, there's, there's two scenarios here. You see a wolf coming. You're either laying down your life for the flock or you're running because you don't care about the flock. So I think challenge yourself. Look at a situation where the Lord's asking you to lay something down and realize that if the Lord asks you to do something and you don't do it, the reality is, the harsh reality is that that simply means in that moment you're not concerned about the flock. That's not a place that I want to be. And sometimes uh, I think I've missed the boat on opportunities. I think more often than not, recently I have not, uh, at least I hope not. But my challenge is look for those opportunities, but be ready and be willing before you get there and know the answer you're going to give when questioned. Finally, and I hope this is the right passage because my last one was not. Um, This one's going to be in Ezekiel, so give me a second to find it here. Um, and this is going to be the last thing I really talk about. Uh, it's Ezekiel 34, 11 to 16. And it says, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep and will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the streams and in all the habited places of the land. I will feed them in a good pasture and their grazing ground will be on the mountain heights of Israel. 
There they will lie down on good grazing ground and feed in rich pastures on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock and I will lead them to rest, declares the Lord. I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken and strengthen the sick. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with judgment. As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will judge between one sheep and another, between the rams and the male goats. That verse we were talking about before, uh, there at the t very end of that. But the reality is this, that's God's promise. And if we are to be imitators of Christ, that means that's our direction. That's our charge, right? If we're imitating what the Lord is doing, there's no fault in that. There's no way that we miss the boat. And so I'm going to read the part again. I will feed my flock, lead them to rest. I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken, and strengthen the sick. That's kind of our charge. Seek the lost, bind up the people that are broken, strengthen those that are sick, but also feed the flock, encourage them to rest, and lead them beside those quiet waters. So the challenge here and the purpose of this was to be a good shepherd. That means looking for those that are lost. I think we understand that charge quite well. I don't know that we, I necessarily, before studying for this um, in the past, understood the severity of that charge, but we understand that charge. The charge that I'm leaving, with, I'm leaving with you tonight is to put that same intensity and that same effort into loving, feeding, and encouraging this flock to rest. Because if these shepherds, the ones they're seeing in this room, aren't well rested, then how are they going to go seek out the lost? And if none of us have the strength or the ability to seek out the lost, then who's going to? And that's not a place I want to be. I don't want to be a part of a body of believers that is self-inclined in a way that they don't encourage each other and therefore no one has energy to seek out the lost because there's a lot of people out there that are broken. There's a lot of people that are sick and weak. And there's a lot of people that just are dispirit dispirited because they don't have that hope that we have. If they stay that way, in many cases, is going to be a function of if we choose to get up and do something or not. And so I hope that that's what we'll do. Let's pray. God, I thank you that uh, you lay out in Scripture very clearly what we're supposed to do. God, that you are, you don't hold that back, Lord. There's no secret that we're supposed to love the lost and love the believers, Lord, that we're supposed to seek after the lost and that we're supposed to build up the body. Lord, I pray that tonight we would do that, that we would make it a priority to reach out to someone that we know is hurting. Uh, Lord, that in the weeks and months to come, that we would reach out to the people that we, are know, that we know are hurting. Lord, that we would seek out the lost, that we would identify who they may be and build up those relationships. Lord, I pray that uh, the things of this earth, the things that are in front of us now, wouldn't be stumbling blocks, Lord, and that we would recognize them for being worthless, Lord, that we would consider them a loss compared to the surpassing knowledge of knowing who you are. Uh, Lord, and I pray that with that sense of importance, we would realize the urgency to reach out to people that, as of now, are on their way to hell. Lord, we love you, and we pray that we would have opportunities to get to know you better. Amen.